They say you should never meet your heroes. So when somebody said to me they had an ultra rare bitter SC and did I want to drive it, I had to really think about it for maybe as much as a whole nanosecond before I bit his arm off. Here's how that went. Erich Bitter was a German racing driver who had a decent amount of talent, but also three bad accidents in the 1960s, which made him give up racing and focus on his business career instead. I say he was a racing driver. Happily, Erich Bitter is very much still with us. Anyway, he was a car dealer and he sold rallying equipment and he became the German importer for, first of all, a bath who make hot Fiat's and into Mechanica who made very beautiful looking but very fragile and rather badly thrown together Italian low volume exotic sports cars. These Intermechanicas were so badly put together that Eric decided that he could do better and pick up that mainly Italian tradition of putting low volume exotic sports car bodies onto somebody else's mechanicals, but he would do it with more emphasis on quality control. He chose proven mechanicals from Opel for his starting point and then went ahead and proved himself right. First of all with the CD in 1973 and then in 1979 with this car, the SC. The SC used the running gear from the Opel Senator Monza range and so it shares its DNA with my Vauxhall Royale and also the Australian Holden Commodore. Early cars used the same 3 litre engine as the Opels but later there was an option of a 3.9 version with a longer stroke carried out by the German tuning house Mansell. This gave considerably increased performance and was an option that pretty much everybody ticked, including the original owner of this car. I first came across the Bitter SC when I went to the motor show, Motor Fair, at Earl's Court in 1985. And for me, it was one of the real highlights of the show. There were two. There was the MG EXE concept, which uh, prefigured the MGF, and the Bitter stand, where they showed not just the two-door coupe like this one, but also the four-door version, which is an awesome looking machine. Imagine if the Jaguar XJ40 had been designed just with a ruler and set square and had pop-up headlamps thrown into the mix and that's pretty much what you've got with the four-door version of the Bitter SC. Both it and the two-door coupe and there's a drop head convertible as well all looked amazing but I don't think I'd seen one certainly not in the metal since that day until the other day when I got to meet this one so did it live up to my memories of how glorious they are and just as importantly what's it like to drive? I think the most striking thing as you drive it is the is the sound. It doesn't sound like a six cylinder to me. It's got a much more of a V8 kind of burble. And more V8 levels of torque, I think, as well. It pulls up the hill nicely, thrumming along as it does. And although it's a big car, and you're very aware of the length of the bonnet as we go through these narrow, twisty lanes, it doesn't feel like a big lumbering thing. Now, what's the turning circle like? And is, am I going to poke the nose out? No. Can't really see where the corners are. Feels a bit more wieldy than the XJS does, I, I think. It's probably the closest thing to anything of mine as, as a driving experience. It's more like the XJS than the, than the Royale because of the size and the shape and the driving position. We're sitting very low here. The seats are really supportive. The seats are better than the XJS. And you've got that quite low letterbox windscreen. You can't see too much of the bonnet, but you're aware that it's there out the front. But uh, it's a much more special driving experience than that sounds, and, and I'm being very gentle with the throttle. Because it's not the sort of car that invites you to thrash it along and hustle it and fling it around the country lanes. It doesn't have that kind of feel to it. I'm sure speed-wise and even handling-wise probably it could. But it's not tempting you to do that. It's not that kind of a driving experience. And now we're behind a cyclist. While we're dawdling along at cycling up hill speed, I can enjoy the ambience here of these rather striking gold dials but they're sort of it's actually more classy than that sounds it's a sort of muted matte coppery sort of color it's actually really quite classy a uh, little bit of wood here and certainly less than the rather 70s wood effect formica that's all over the dash of my royale 
there's some shove there. But we'd have been uh, we'd have been in the Vauxhall Astra if I'd pushed hard. Uh, but there was plenty just on a gentle squeeze of the throttle pedal, and lots more in reserve, I think. Peak power is about 5,000 RPM, I think. But the the torque is lower; it's about three and a half. But there's it feels like the, the torque curve is probably quite flat because there's plenty even at lower engine speeds. It's just, just below 60 miles an hour here and it's just relaxed, lolloping along. It's unstressed. It's not too worried. It's doing 20 odd thousand RPM. Obviously what I mean is it's doing 2000 RPM, not 20,000 RPM, but what's a factor of 10 between friends? It just feels like you could crack on like this all day long. It rides really nicely. This uh, this is not it's not a bad road surface, but it's uh, it's a little bit jiggly. But the bitter is riding it really nicely. It feels very smooth, much more so than most modern cars. And for something that is as low slung and sporty as this, I think it's doing a really fine job. Steering's lightish. It's not pin sharp and hugely responsive in a in a sports car kind of way. Uh, it's a steering box on these, the same as the uh, Opals and, and my Royale, rather than rack and pinion. Probably doesn't make for the sharpest steering, but it's it's pretty good. Probably best suited to sweeping roads rather than uh, tighter, twisty stuff. Styling-wise, the Bitter SC is more 80s than Big Hair and Nick Kamen's laundry, but that's not necessarily an entirely bad thing. Inside, the ruched leather is actually pretty tastefully done, and that's no mean trick to pull off. This sober black colour helps. They're a little bit more garish if you spec them in bright red, for example. But it's pretty well done and not over the top, unlike some others that I could name at Maserati I'm looking at you. The dash architecture is basically much the same as the donor Opel Senator Monza, but retrimmed in leather, which I guess lifts it. Not sure I necessarily would have bothered really. It's certainly no more homemade looking, perhaps that's a little bit harsh, craftsman made looking by hand, let's say, than the XJS is, although it doesn't have all that walnut, if you like that sort of thing. It feels more open and expansive in here than I think the XJS does. Um, it's quite wide. The scuttle is a long way forward, unlike the XJS, where you, if you wave to somebody, you hit your hands on the windscreen. The Bitter doesn't feel like a handmade car. It's solid, it doesn't creak, it doesn't rattle, the shut lines are nice and even, and it feels very well put together. And it wasn't handmade, it was actually mechanised production, but at a very low volume, carried out by specialists. The body panels and shell were built by Majora in Turin. The interior was trimmed locally in Italy as well, before the partly finished car was shipped to either Bitter's own factory in Schwelm in the Ruhr area of Germany, or to Steyr in Austria for final assembly and the addition of the Opel components, the drivetrain. This gave Bitter the best of both worlds, the advantages of mechanised production, but at extremely low volumes. And we are talking extremely low volumes here. Over the life cycle of the car, about 450, 460 of these two-door coupes were built, a couple of dozen of the convertibles, and just five of those wonderful four-door sedans. Would I be put off by what you might consider its humble General Motors up, uh, underpinnings? Well, no, not really. That engine might have started out life as a 3-litre cam in head from the Opel Senator. Not a bad engine, but not an exotic one. But by the time it's been stroked out to 3.9 litres and had whatever exhaust system this has got on it, it doesn't sound anything like any six-cylinder that I've heard. And 3.9 litres is probably the biggest six-cylinder that I can think of off the top of my head. Let me know if you can think of a bigger one. And even the wheels, which I'd always taken just to be straight lift from the Senator, really nice five spokes, actually they're chunkier than that. And in fact, it turns out they're from the Opel Manta 400. Well, now given that those change hands for upwards of about £80,000 these days, you might want to rethink any sniffiness about the humble Opel underpinnings. On the subject of humble underpinnings, they're not all necessarily that humble. The door handles I recognise as being exactly the same as the ones 
runs on my Vauxhall Royale. But these front indicator lights are from the Ferrari Mondial, and I think the pop-up headlamp units are from the same car. Which reminds me, if you've watched the video this far, then it's time you get rewarded with a pop-up headlamp moment. The tail lights are from the Lancia Monte Carlo. I always assumed they were the same as the ones on the Fiat X19, but they're different. Only Lancia could design a set of lights that look almost exactly the same as the ones that their parent company already had, but are in fact a completely different unit that just looks the same. Is it a better car than an XJS? Well, that's a difficult question. It's a different car. It has different strengths. It doesn't have the silky smoothness of the V12, I guess, if, when the V12 is on song. Mine isn't at the moment. It's a bit off its feed and only firing on about nine or ten cylinders, so the bitter definitely has it licked in the smoothness stakes. I really like the SJ XJS and always have to drive, to sit in, just to look at out of the window when it's broken. But those things are all true of the bitter as well. It's not an easy call to make. So if it combines the best of the Jaguar XJS with the Vauxhall Royale, I've got one of each of those. So if I sold those, that could be enough to maybe stretch to one of the, only takes up one parking space, which would free up space for that Rover 220 